Take your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Follow along with me from the Word of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened the belt of truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as for shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith that with, the, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication, To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This ends the reading of the word of God. On June 4th, 1915, 40, in the midst of a war-torn Europe, with Great Britain under attack and on the brink of invasion, a weary but resolved Winston Churchill delivered one of his finest wartime speeches before the House of Commons. Churchill said this, Even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have fallen or may fall in the grip of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of Nazi rule, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and the oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight in the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And even if, which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part of it were subjected and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until in God's good time, The new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. This is one of Churchill's most famous speeches during World War II, titled, We Shall Fight on the Beaches. He was a man for his time. He was a man to rally the troops when it was needed. It was a call to war, to prepare for war, to engage in the conflict and the struggle that he was facing, that they were facing in Nazi Germany. And when we read this text here in Ephesians, we must understand that Paul has put his general's hat on. He has come to the the, the culmination of his letter here. And Paul is like a general here preparing his troops for war. It is an aggressive passage here in chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. It is the culmination of all of the doctrine, all of the practice of Ephesians to be found here. If we do not understand and we do not get Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, we do not get the book. It is the whole point. You would read here in verse 10, he starts out with a famous word, finally. Finally here should not be understood as in conclusion, but rather we should understand this word here in verse 10 as as a result of, or in other words. 
oftentimes when we get to the finally of the sermon, one of two things happen to us. For some of us, we wake up at finally. Others of us tune out because we believe it is coming to an end. When you read this word right here, finally, pay careful attention. Pay careful attention to what the apostle has to say because it is the summary of all of his doctrine. It is practice. It is the practice of all of the theology, all of the doctrine of Ephesians. We now reach the peak. And think of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, as a mountain range. In each chapter, there are peaks not that there's any valleys, but there are, there are high points throughout Ephesians. And we are reaching here the last mountain of Ephesians. And it is built as though you have gone through and traversed every other mountain that you can look back upon. And you can recall and remember because you are bringing the whole body of work together. We reach the peak of chapter 6 and the, cumulative, the cumulative effect of all the doctrine and practice in the Christian life. And this is a call to prepare for war. Verses uh, 10 through 20 is one continuous thought. But it is so loaded, there is so much truth embedded in this that there is no way that I could get this done in 45 minutes. So we have broken this into two parts. We will consider verses 10 through 13 tonight in the preparing for war. And then next Lord's Day morning, we will, con- we will conclude the armor of God. And then so the following Sunday night, we will finish our journey through Ephesians. But for this evening, let us consider Paul's words under the sermon that I have titled, Preparing for War, the Armor of God. And the first thing I want us to notice under the first heading I would supply for you is the call to prepare. You would see in verses 10 and 11, Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. First thing I would like to call your attention to is how we are to prepare. The call and how, he says, Primarily here, be strong. Be strong. What this means, this word here, he's saying be continually strengthened. This is something that happens to you. This word is written in the passive voice. This, what he's basically saying here is that God by the Holy Spirit is the active agent in the strengthening of the believer. But you are to be strengthened. You are to be strong. Writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, the apostle would say, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This is not something that we do to ourselves, but it is something that happens to us. That being said, in order for us to effectively prepare, we must put ourselves in situations where we can be strengthened. Lately, I have uh, taken up running. Uh, it's just something that, uh, for, for my overall health, and um, it is good. And I was thinking the other day, I was sitting at my table, and I was thinking about this word of, though it's passive, sitting at my table, there's probably a 0% chance that I'm going to get hit by a car. It, just, it would be very strange uh, at all. But when I go out running, I'm running on the road, the chances are more likely that I could get hit by a car. If the car hits me, I'm still the passive one. The car is the one that is active, that ran into me. But I put myself in a situation where that could happen. Though I'm still passive, I'm in a situation that this could happen. And so when we think about being strengthened, though it is passive to us, we must put ourselves in situations where this can happen. So what does this look like for us? How are, what are means in which we can be strengthened through the Holy Spirit, by God, through, through God by the Holy Spirit? We are strengthened through prayer, through Bible intake, through service. Here's a big one, through corporate worship. 
You being here right now is putting yourself in a situation where you can be strengthened through the ministry of God's word applied to you by the Holy Spirit. We must be doing these things. I have never met a strong Christian who has a weak commitment to the local church. So we must, though we are pa- it is passively being done to us, we put ourselves in that way. So here is the call. Be strong. The heading I would supply to you underneath this call is consider the source. He would say here to be strong in the Lord. Not in ourselves. Not in our resolve. Not in our determination. Not in our power. But in Christ through the Holy Spirit. What does this look like? John 15, I would suggest to you, abiding in Christ. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. We are strengthened. The source of our strength is in the Lord through our lives, abiding in Christ, leaning into him. The call is to be strong. The source is in the Lord. The strength, consider the strength, Paul would say here, in the strength of his might. You notice here, everything is outside of us, right? Because to be strengthened is what is done to us. The source is the Lord. The strength is in the strength of his might. What does this mean here? It's the power of God. It is the power of God in you acting upon you. When you think about the power of God, what thoughts come to your mind? Infinite. Boundless. Limitless. Supreme. I do not think there are adequate words in the English language to describe the power of God. There is no vocabulary in all, in any language that could adequately describe the power of God. You would just need to look back in chapter 1, verse 19, where Paul begins to talk about the power of God. And he doesn't have a word for it. So he uses this Greek compound word that just means beyond the atmosphere, beyond this sphere, translated immeasurable greatness, uncontainable, unfathomable. In 119, he was, he was praying to, for the believers that they might understand and come to know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. The greatest demonstration of the power of God is in the resurrection of the Son of God. But that resurrection that raised the Son of God, you would look over and you would go right to chapter 2, verse 1. Remember, chapter 6 is the culmination of all the body of divinity, all the work of Ephesians. And you would look at chapter 2, verse 1, and he would say, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And then you get down to the verb that God has made us alive together with Christ. The power that raises Christ from the dead is the power and the strength that is at work in you who believe. It is the regenerating power of God. It is at work in you individually. It is at work in the church corporately. This is the strength of his might that we are to, 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 to lean into as we are to be strong. So the call is to be strong, the source, the strength, and the supply. Consider the supply of this call. He would say, put on the whole armor of God. When is armor necessary? When is the time in which you should equip yourself with armor? When there is a battle to face. Armor is not for peacetime. Armor is for wartime. When there is a battle, when there is conflict, when there is preparing for war, You are late to the game if you are putting your armor on in the midst of war. This is why we must prepare. 
the whole armor. And consider I said the supply. It is the armor of God. Christian, understand this. God will never call you to do something that he himself will not give you the source, strength, and supply to accomplish. Let me, let me repeat that. God will never call you to do something that he himself will not give you the source, strength, and supply to accomplish. Some say that God will never give you more than you can handle. That's not a true statement. But on the other end, the pendulum swings, and others say that God will always give you more than you can handle to teach you dependence. It's just trying to make a counter argument. That's just the other extreme. Understand this, believer. What God calls you to do, he equips you to do. He is the source. He is our strength. He is the supply. We are still dependent upon him. So that as we are strengthened, we look back and we could say it's not of ourselves, but it is of him who calls and who equips us. So this is what we are to do. This is how we are to do it. We are to be strong. This is the call to prepare. This is what is done to us. What then are we to do? As we engage in conflict, as we engage in this spiritual conflict that Paul has in mind here, Notice in verse 11, the first two words of verse 11, he says, put on. Whereas be strong is what happens to you, this word here, put on, this is a call to act. This is what you do. Put on quite literally means to dress yourself, to Equip yourself to put on the equipment, to not leave a piece out. And what are we to put on? We are to put on, as Paul would say, the whole armor of God. This word here translated, this is from which we get the word panoply meaning a complete set of armor, lacking in nothing. Lacking in absolutely nothing. This is from two uh, source words. Pos meaning all or everyone. And oplon meaning weapons, tools, and instruments. Putting these words together meaning all the tools, all the instruments, all the armor. Everything that God supplies we are to put on ourselves. And what God supplies is lacking in nothing. Think of Paul as he's writing this letter. He's in prison, most likely in Rome. He's in chains, as he even says at the end of this passage. And day by day, the Roman centurions and soldiers are walking by, and he's observing them with their helmets on and their breastplate and their full suit, the full panoply of armor. And he draws on this vivid imagery as these soldiers are always prepared they're coming in ready for work that day. And he, and he to his Ephesian audience, he, he would write to them in this imagery that they would totally understand. Being fully dressed, fully equipped for the task in front of them. There are many implications here of just this word, whole armor. Again, as I had said, what God supplies is enough. You do not need to supplement what God gives. There is no shortage in the arsenal of God's armory. Furthermore, further, another implication that we could receive from this passage is there is no stronger armor than the one that God supplies, for he is the great supplier. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 for the weapons of our warfare are, n- are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Think of a young David, the shepherd boy. And he comes to camp to bring supplies for his brothers. And he hears word of this giant foe. 
This giant foe that is taunting the people of God, that is taunting the name of God. And David is enraged. David, consumed with the honor of God, feels this holy anger for the, for, for, to, to, to preserve and, to, and to, to let the honor of God be shown among the peoples. And so he takes up the call, I will fight the giant. I will face the adversary. All of Israel is scared, for they had not seen a foe like this in, in, ever in their lives. And so initially, David comes, and they seek to put the armor of Saul on him. We read in 1 Samuel 17, 38, then Saul clothed David. First of all, we know how Saul finishes, and we know that's just a bad statement right there. When it starts, then Saul clothed David, watch out. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and then we would read, and he tried in vain to go. Then David says, this won't work for me. David takes off the armor of man. I'm not trying to spiritualize the text here, but David takes off the armor of man. And I believe in that moment, he put the armor of God on. He grabs his staff. He grabs five stones and marches forward with the biggest shield of faith you'd ever seen. And then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin? But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. David put on the armor of God as he would fight for the honor of God. That is a wonderful picture. The armor. God's supplies will lead to victory if you put it on. If you put it on. Let's make application here even of this point. We fight battles in our lives. You are alive right now. You are fighting a battle. I don't know what it is, but you are fighting a battle. There is spiritual conflict going on right now in this room. We are all fighting battles. We are fighting battles against remaining sin. Christian, if you are saved, remember, sin does not reign, but it does remain. You are fighting battles against your own sin, against the world, and against the devil. When we lose, when we give in to temptation, when we lose our temper, when we say those unkind words, we harbor those critical thoughts and feelings, we must understand that the blame stops with us. We are responsible, and we must openly, honestly, and repentantly recognize our sin and confess it. It isn't because God's supply isn't enough. It isn't because God hasn't given me all things that are necessary to overcome. No, when we sin, when we struggle, when we lose, it's because we're not putting on the armor. It's because we are not leaning into the strength that God supplies. For God has supplied us with the panoply, the whole, the perfect, the complete armor. Understand this, God does not send any of his beloved children into a suicide mission. So he would say here, back in verse 11... That you may be able, you have been equipped, you've put on God's armor, God's uh, source of his strength to, 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 to guard you, that you may be able to stand. Here's the call to prepare. Be wearing the armor that God supplies so that you stand a fighting chance. If you are not prepared for the enemy, you have already been defeated. So this is the call to prepare Consider here under the next heading I would supply to you the challenge to face. The challenge to face. The apostle writes 
stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Here is the challenge to face. Stand against, he would say. To be firmly grounded, to be rooted like a tree whose root system is both deep and wide. Think of the picture of Psalm 1, of the blessed man. So that when the storms of life and the trials come, you will, you will be able to withstand the forces. Christian, we stand on a solid rock that is unshakable. This language here that he says suggests facing something head on. Not to have your back turned to the enemy. You are ineffective if you are not facing your opponent. As we prepare for war, we are not to have our guards down or our backs turned, but rather we are to face the opponent and not give up an inch of ground. This is what it means to stand against. You are an impenetrable wall. This is the challenge to face. And what is it that we are actually talking about even here tonight? He would say the schemes of the devil. The schemes of the devil. This is the tactics of the evil one. The devices that he uses to wage war against the people of God. There is no passivity in the Christian life. When you become a Christian, you are, you are thrust into the conflict. And this is a conflict that has far dated you and will go on far after you. But you are in the midst of war even right now. And it is a spiritual war that we fight. To, to not be mindful is to lose. So what's the schemes of the devil? Well, consider this. When he first comes on the scene, how is he described? Your first encounter with the devil in the scriptures, he's described as crafty. The crafty serpent. More crafty than any other. We must understand that in preparing for war, we have the intel. We have, we are the ones with the advantage. We know the schemes of our opponent. We know who our opponent is. We know how our opponent likes to act. There is a testimony of history that shows us. So we can be prepared, and we are to know and be prepared for two things that Paul would give us here, Satan's schemes and Satan's forces. And we need not look any further than the word of God for Satan's schemes, as we would see in the Bible. His name, his name itself gives us a clue to what his schemes are. This word here, devil, diabolos, it means slanderer. Separator, adversary. So we see in Genesis chapter 3, I'll just give you a quick tour of what he does. In Genesis chapter 3, what does he do? He slanders God. Did God actually say? So he slanders God, and as a result of the slander of God, he creates separation from God and his people. So they buy into the slander, and now they're separated. Now they are adverse to God. He causes them to, 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 to lack a trust in the word of God. In Matthew chapter 4, after Jesus is baptized, Jesus goes out into the, into the wilderness, and he encounters the devil. And what does the devil do? The devil knows the Bible. The devil quotes and misquotes and misapplies scripture. These are his schemes. Listen, the devil's not a red guy with horns and a black goatee and a pitchfork. That's too obvious. He's been at this too long. You won't fall for that. No, he's, he's perfected his craft over time to where he would use the Bible. In 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14, he masquerades as an angel of light. He is the accuser of the brethren. We sing the song, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of my guilt within. What's, what do we do? Upward I look and see him there who put an end to all my sin. What is a way in which the schemes of the devil work today? Remember, always think in terms of slander and separation. Well, 
why does Paul emphasize almost through every one of his letters the need for unity? Because slander leads to separation. It is a scheme of the devil. Remember, we are to be unified. So to create disunity in the church is a scheme of the devil. Another way, he mixes truth with error. A little bit of Jesus talk on erroneous speech. Sadly, today, when people talk about Jesus, you have to ask the question, which Jesus? He has been at this for a long time. Again, I say he has perfected his craft, and this is why we need to be prepared. You need to be students of Scripture. You should be students of history. We should know what has been happened. You, you understand this. Every heresy that has ever come up against the church happened in the first 400 years. There is no other system of doctrine, erroneous, her heretical doctrine that the church has faced. And all it has been is a cycle and a repeat under different names and different guises because the schemes have all been thrown. All hell was let loose against the church of Jesus Christ in the first 400 years and the church is still standing because Jesus said, I will build my church. And so as, this, as the evil one has nothing else to throw at it, he just repeats it. The difference is he's got new people that aren't aware of everything. Nothing new under the sun. Be prepared for the schemes. He's been at this for a long time. Paul would go, we'll, we'll continue and move along here in verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. The enemy is not people per se. Remember that. Remember that in how you look at other people, especially those outside of the Christian faith. He says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. He's talking about physical humanity. It is not those of a different political party or have a different moral or sexual ethic than us. That's not what he's getting at here. We know we should not be wrestling against those people. We should be wrestling for those people. They are under the control of the evil one. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers from keeping them to see the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We labor against the God of this world. We wage war against the evil one. And this is the challenge that we face. We understand the schemes of Satan. Now we understand the forces of Satan Paul would give here. He's telling you who your opponent is, who you are going to fight in battle. This is the perfect plan to prepare for war. Against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. A statement like this would cause many to question just looking at this and say, that's bizarre. Because we live in such a naturalistic world that we are so focused on the physical that we lose sight of a spiritual conflict that goes on all around us. We live in two realms. We live in the spiritual, we live in the physical. And it is, all, it is not all physical. We must understand this. These words here, the rulers, authorities, cosmic power, spiritual forces. Paul is describing here the scope of Satan's forces. These are his fallen angels, demons under his control that do his bidding. In the fall of the heavenly beings, we would read that one third of all the angels who sided with Lucifer fell with him. And these are the demonic forces that are at work in our world today. And they influence rulers and authority. They are cosmic powers and spiritual forces. I'm talking in the spiritual and I'm talking in the abstract. What does that look like? What does that look like for me on a Monday morning? They are the ones who hold, bondage, hold the, the people in sin in bondage. Again, you would read just back in chapter 2, verse 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, the present darkness, following the prince of the power of the air, this is, this is Satan himself, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Paul would write here again that it is over the present darkness and in the heavenly places. This is the this is the scope, this is the, the, the realm of this warfare that we face. Our war is in the spiritual realm. Manifest in the physical. 
Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. How's the fight? How's the battle going? The struggle is real. What this means is that yelling at somebody on Facebook is not engaging in warfare. Intercessory prayer outside of planned parenthood is engaging in this warfare. Intentional, active evangelism is engaging in this warfare. Laboring for the souls of men and women is how we would engage in this warfare. Every soul that is saved is a transfer from the kingdom, and I would say the army of darkness under the power of the evil one into light. Remember, the enemy operates in the spiritual realm, so never lay your guard down. Never lay your guard down. People are used by him and his forces to carry out his schemes. So Paul would say here, stand against him. And finally, yep, that's that point in the sermon, right? (laughs) The charge to embrace. That means pay careful attention, right? Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand firm. As I read this, I envision all caps and a ton of exclamation points. This is not passive language at all. This is wartime speech. There is no passivity. There is no laying the guard down. He is, again, he is repeating himself here. He says, now take up the whole armor of God. The apostle is revisiting his command of of verse 10. It wasn't that long ago that he had just said this, to put on the armor of God in verse 11. Now again, he gets to 13, and he says, take it up, therefore, the whole armor of God. He is a master wordsmith. Paul is one of the most educated men uh, in the first century. All of his words matter. And the repetition here that we see stresses the seriousness and the emphasis. It is not because he's lacking things to say. So quite literally what he says here is lay hold of the spiritual armor that God supplies. Bring it with you. Same word take up, used to describe when Jesus was taken up into heaven as he ascended and he was taken up on that, on that day. And what Paul is getting at here is just as Jesus was taken up into heaven, we ourselves with great intentional force, understand this, great intentional force are to take up the supply of God's arsenal. And notice again, he says, the full armor of God, nothing is lacking. From head to toe, the Christian is to be covered. From helmet to sandals, he would describe it. The myth of Achilles is a famous Greek story. Achilles' father was Peleus. He was a king, and his mother was Theotis, a sea nymph. Achilles was half man, half god. After Achilles was born, his mother wanted to protect him from harm. She held him by the heel and dipped him into the river Styx. In Greek mythology, the river Styx was located in the underworld and had special powers. Achilles became invulnerable everywhere but at his heel where his mother had dipped him. Achilles was a great warrior, and he continued to battle the Trojans, and it seemed like he could not be killed. However, the Greek god Apollo knew his weakness. When Paris of Troy shot an arrow at Achilles, Apollo guided it so that it struck Achilles on the heel. Achilles eventually died from the wound. 
And so came the term, the Achilles heel, as to describe a personal weakness. Understand this, that the armor of God covers everything. That there is no Achilles heel when we are fully equipped with what God supplies. There is no spot left vulnerable when we are equipped with the panoply, the whole armor. So to make application here, the issue that we face is when we leave a piece behind. If we are not protecting our minds with the helmet of salvation, we are left vulnerable. When we are not defending ourselves with the shield of faith, we become doubters. Understand this, Christian, God's provision is enough. That we might be able to withstand in the evil day, in the day of battle, in the moment of temptation, the feeling of weakness, you will be ready if you are equipped. Failure to prepare is to prepare for failure. We must be proactive in this battle against sin and self and Satan. If we are reactive, we will fail. You decide long before temptation comes how you're going to react to that temptation. Remember this morning what Job did. Made a covenant with his eyes that he would not look upon an alma, a virgin. Why, he decided that long before the situation occurred. And so we are to be prepared so that when the evil day, the day of temptation, the day of trial, the day of adversity comes, we are ready because we have taken up the armor that God has given. Having done all, he would say in 13, stand firm. We have been given our call, dress for battle. We have been given and told our opponent, Satan and his forces, and now is our charge. Having done all, stand firm. Four times in four verses. Stand against, withstand, stand firm. And then beginning in 14, as though you haven't got the point, right? Beginning at 14, I, look how he ends 13 and into 14. Stand firm. And then 14, stand therefore this is great emphasis. Exhaust your resources. Always be ready in the day of trials. Stand your ground. It is not enough to just hold the line. We need to be advancing the line as well. This is not just defensive. This is both defensive and offensive language here. When temptations come to you, Christian, dig in. Lean into Christ. Lean into what God has done. You, you can overcome through the power of God. When assaults come, deflect the blows with the shield of faith. When slanderous thoughts come to your mind, understand where's the source. Slander and separation, remember that. Critical attitudes want to creep in. Guard your heart with the breastplate of righteousness. Resist him. Endure trials, gain ground, stand firm. So what are some ways we can stand even tonight? Stand for righteousness. Fight for holiness in your life. Holiness is not a passive pursuit. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. Stand for truth. It is better to be hated for truth than to be loved for falsehood. Do not bow, do not bend, and do not break. One, one of the schemes of the evil one is to try to have churches compromise by embracing cultural trends that oppose the word of God. Stand firm on the gospel. The person and work of Jesus Christ, no surrender, no compromise, no giving an inch. And I would also call on you, evaluate your life. Are there areas of weakness? What is your Achilles heel? Impulsiveness? Pride? Insecurity? Fear? Anxiety? Understand this. That is the area that needs to be addressed Remember, he's more crafty than any other beast of the field. And he goes after your area of weakness to exploit it so that your sin 
will then be known to many. Because once your sin, once he has exploited the area of weakness in you, he wants to expose you. And it is good that many others would know about the sin of Christians so that you would be seen as a hypocrite. That is a tactic and a scheme of the evil one. Cover yourself in the armor supplied by God, strengthened by God. And remember, you are not a lone soldier. A lone soldier is a soldier alone. We are called to be the church of Jesus Christ. And there is strength in numbers. We are the army of God on earth. And if you are at this alone in isolation, you can be surrounded very easily. But when you stand with the people of God and you are in community and fellowship with the church of God, in covenant with the people of God, you stand together. And that is the call here, that we stand together as a collection of individuals corporately as the body of Jesus Christ in this place. Stay connected with the church of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the call that you have given to us, that you have made us mindful and aware of the adversity and the opponent that we face. Lord, we pray that you would help us in our areas of weakness, Lord, that we would lean upon you. We would mortify the sin of the flesh. We would take up the armor supplied by you. We would find our strength in you as you as our, our source, our hope of life, Thank you for the conflict that you have put us into. And we know that we are alive in Christ because of these things, Lord. And may we wage war effectively for the glory that is due your name, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.